So uh, my idea today is to share with you some of the issues that we have encountered um, while looking for positive electrode materials for calcium batteries. We started on these a while ago, and, uh, and since then we have made some progresses, but still we have, come, we have come across some difficulties, so I hope we can all share these experiences here and, and learn from, from each other. So, of course, I do not need to introduce the, uh, the interest of looking for alternative battery technologies to this audience. Uh, batteries are expanding their field of, of application to, to other uh, uh, places, in some cases at a very large scale, which, which have different needs in terms of energy density, cost, and so on. Sustainability is an issue, and this is the reason why, likely, already back in 2016, uh, next-generation batteries were chosen as one of the top ten emerging technologies just after the Internet of Things by the, by the World Economic Forum at Davos. So a long way since then, and we have made some progresses, but, but uh, uh, as we have already seen this morning and so on, there are a lot of issues to, to, um, to solve still. Of course, when one is thinking of uh, alternative uh, battery technologies based on other metals, uh, there are two main uh, families of, of uh, technologies one can consider. Uh, and in this case, I'm thinking mostly in, in organic electrolytes, because in aqueous electrolytes, the presence of protons uh, can be an, an, an additional issue to, uh, to, to, those, to those development or, or, or an additional benefit, but it, the system is completely different. But if one is thinking in organic electrolytes, we can just think in an analogy to the lithium-ion battery, where there is no metal in any of the electrodes, just compounds which react reversibly with the... Um, with the cations, and in this case, uh, the, the lithium is only the charge carrier. So there is a priori no reason why we cannot change these, these uh, charge carriers by other metals, including multivalent metals. And uh, in this case, the energy density is not really related to, to the metal. It's just that, okay, the operation voltage for the negative electrode is limited by the plating and stripping voltage of the metal. But uh, it's the electrode capacities and voltage which determine the final energy density. The thing here is that with multivalent uh, ions, the Coulombic interactions for the transport, both in the electrodes and the electrolyte, may play a role. But essentially, this is somehow similar to lithium ion, and the most similar system, of course, is the sodium ion because of the chemical similarity, and, and one does not have the issues related to multivalent ions. But the more interesting concept is to use a metal as a negative electrode, because they can deliver very high energy density. But those come to an additional issue, is that we need to master the process of reversible uh, electrodeposition of the metal. And this is by no means easy, not even with single valent metal. So here, really, this is the most challenging concept. But when looking for new technologies, I think that this, this is really worth the effort, and here you can see them. Uh, the volumetric and gravimetric capacities of some metals, just compared with, with graphite, which is the state of the art of, in the lithium ion battery technology. And for um, uh, multivalent metals, you see that because they are multivalent, you can get very high uh, capacities, both at gravimetric and volumetric uh, um, scale, depending on, on the density, of course. And another interesting metric is just a look at the, at the standard redox potential. And of course, for aluminum is more limited, magnesium is lower, and calcium is really uh, very similar to lithium and sodium. So a priori, making uh, calcium metal anode batteries, if we are able to find high voltage cathodes, we could get very high energy density. Of course, we were not the same. The first to, to think on, on, on these um, technology, and this is a, wants to be a historical chart. So the, the first use of calcium is, was an, as an additive in, in lead acid batteries, but the, in the 60s, they already thought that uh, calcium was electropositive enough to develop uh, uh, metal anode batteries. In this case, this was considered for primary thermal batteries, uh, for uh, uh, military applications mostly. And there was even uh, the consideration of using uh, uh, molten salt or solid electrolytes at the time. This research was mostly empiric, and uh, the publication just report assembly of a cell, performance, but there is no material science 
uh, uh, investigations inside. And I would say that maybe the more rational development of, of, of calcium came later on in the, in the 80s. And this uh, was pioneered by, by Stanievitz and, and Emmanuel Pellet in Israel. And they were looking at this time uh, to substitute lithium in, in the thionyl chloride batteries by calcium, uh, claiming that calcium could be safer. Uh, these are uh, primary uh, batteries, and the idea was that calcium would have higher conductivity and higher melting point than, than lithium, and that upon cell reversal, calcium plating would not take place. So this would be a safer alternative. And the impossibility of calcium plating was attributed to the fact that the passivation layer form, sort of SEI in, in, this, uh, in this technology, consisted of calcium chloride, and then this was not uh, enabling the transport of, of calcium ions. So uh, when we started on this, we wanted to really see whether we could have interesting uh, uh, properties at the, at, the f at the cell level. And uh, we were not able to do uh, simulations as nice as those shown by Brian Ingram this morning for the, for the magnesium um, uh, systems, because there was not even a proof of concept of any cell. So there were so many assumptions that we had to take that we decided that we would use a very simple model. It is a simple, uh, a single uh, uh, Excel uh, spreadsheet uh, published by Eric Berg when he was still in Peter Novak's group in, in Switzerland. And the idea is that one would take uh, a, a cell made of one composite uh, positive electrode mimicking very much uh, the composition and, uh, and the porosity and so on of optimized uh, composite electrodes for the lithium-ion battery technology. And we would consider a metal anode. And in this case, uh, they did uh, some calculations for lithium sulfur or lithium metal anodes. They were considering an excess of lithium. So we did the same for calcium. We considered an excess. And we considered some uh, real materials with uh, the density, but also some hypothetical materials and um, this is what we get. So the, we uh, uh, calculated materials, so the, the, the performances at the cell level in terms of energy density for uh, metal, calcium metal anode batteries with excess of calcium and possible hypothetical uh, positive electrode materials with voltages from 2 to 4.5 and capacities from 50 to 300. And you see that even with uh, moderate figures of merit, we would be on par with uh, state-of-the-art lithium-ion battery technologies, both gravimetrically and volumetrically. So, of course, this is back-of-the-envelope calculations, and we assumed uh, um, we try to assume as, as realistic parameters as possible, but still this at least means that this uh, means to be further studied. So the main issue at, the, at, at that point was that the calcium, viable calcium electrodeposition had not been proved. And in fact, there were pioneering uh, studies by the group of Doron Auerbach in Israel, who, as you know, they did the proof of concept for the magnesium uh, uh, batteries, and they, uh, they tried to electrodeposit calcium in organic solvents, such as those used for the, for the uh, lithium-ion batteries, and uh, they came to the, to the conclusion that calcium electro electrodeposition in organic solvents was not possible. And this, uh, again, the, due to the fact that the SEI form would not, be, not really be an SEI, would not be a solid electrolyte, and would not be able to... to um, uh, conduct uh, calcium. So, of course, this hindered any, any uh, investigation about cathode, with some exceptions, like the work of uh, Glenn Amatucci, who studied calcium intercalation in V205, or, or also some work in, in Argonne National Lab, where they studied uh, Prussian blues later on. But uh, it's true that uh, not having an electrolyte would limit the technology. So we, we directed our first efforts to see whether we could find an electrolyte. So uh, we started uh, sparked by curiosity, the most relevant thing, scientific curiosity, the promise of potential interesting future performance, and also the fact that this technology was based on calcium, which is very abundant. And of course, we would like to focus on uh, positive electrode materials also containing abundant elements. But the first question was, why is calcium electrodeposition thought to be impossible? 
Is it because of calcium mobility in the electrolyte, because of desolvation at the surface of the electrode, or if there is an SEI because of transport across this SEI or even nucleation? So we were lucky to be funded by Toyota for a um, uh, risky project, so to say, a one-year project, and we were able to see that just uh, using conventional electrolyte formulations, in this case was a mixture of ethylene and propylene carbonate with calcium BF4 as salt, we were able to plate and strip calcium if we increase the temperature to break ion pairs. Uh, so this is the deposit we got, and of course this is far from being uh, practically useful because uh, the capacity is stable upon cycling, but the Coulombic efficiency is still too low because at this temperature we get a lot of electrolyte decomposition, but that was already something. And uh, here you can see, for instance, calcium-calcium symmetric cells at 100 degrees C. You see that they have a uh, nice cyclability but huge polarization. And for comparison, here you have lithium-lithium uh, uh, lithium symmetric cells at room temperature. So really, there is still room for improvement, but it is already uh, the first proof that calcium electrodeposition is not impossible. So luckily, this uh, work was followed by others. Uh, for instance, uh, the group of Peter Bruce uh, also uh, published this, uh, this other electrolyte formulation with calcium BH4 in THF. In this case, with very high efficiency, the issue is that the stability of this electrolyte at high potential is moderate, and also there is a, a, um, a formation of calcium hydride uh, layer on, the, on top of the electrodeposited calcium. And then there came the work by the group of Max Fickner and Zirong uh, Zaukarger and also Linda Nazar, or, and they developed uh, a borate salt, which I'm sure is not easy to prepare but uh, seems to work uh, really well. So finally, new uh, compositions are coming into scene. There is work also at, at uh, Nick in Slovenia, unraveling new salt. So electrolytes is a, a tricky business, but there we are starting to have more and more um, formulations, which enable calcium plating and stripping under different circumstances. So this, of course, now opens the way to start screening positive electrode materials. So uh, when, we, uh, when we started with this, this was the only electrolyte we had at the time. It has the advantage that this salt is commercial. It's very tricky to dry, but at least uh, it's, uh, one can buy it uh, in a simple way. And we, we started testing materials at 100 degrees C, but we soon realized that we, we had to work a lot on the protocols for testing. Coming from the lithium-ion battery field, one would naively think that we would like to screen our positive electrode material just testing against uh, calcium metal, uh, pretty much like one does in, in the lithium business, in half cells. But of course, this uh, is not a good idea because, as you have seen, calcium electrodes are very polarized, so this will for sure mislead the results, so we need a third electrode. And uh, then we come to the question, which is the best uh, reference electrode? So finally, it took us a while uh, to, to develop reliable protocols. We need to make sure that the reference uh, uh, electrode is stable. We need to make sure uh, which counter electrode we use that the, so that the uh, capacity is in excess, that the redox behavior is well known. And then, of course, we are, look, we are working with new electrolyte formulations, which we do not know well. So there can be a lot of side reactions, and we can easily misinterpret the results we get. So all in all, the, the main problem is that we don't have any standard component. All of them have issues. So looking for new components is really a pain in the neck because you need to double check uh, all the processes going on all the time. But uh, even uh, in this situation, we decided to screen uh, inorganic compounds in analogy to the, to the lithium ion. We were looking for mostly intercalation uh, processes, which we thought would ensure cyclability. We were looking for transition metal as a redox center, uh, either oxides, sulfides, or even nitrides, and for phases containing or not calcium in the crystal structure, because of course if we're uh, working in, in against a calcium uh, metal um, uh, electrode, we will have calcium in excess. So we uh, investigated both traditional intercalation hosts as V205 or TIS2, and then we were exploring also uh, calcium transition metal oxides, which is a very rich uh, family of compounds. 
So first we started experimentally, it was guided by intuition, trying to, to look at interesting uh, crystal structures. And uh, of course, one obvious one is the perovskite, because it, this is a very rich uh, family of compounds. And amongst the simple perovskites, the, the molybdenum one seemed interesting. And uh, because of the rich uh, redox chemistry of molybdenum, we could exchange even two electrons per mole. And the issue is that we prepared this phase, we tried to extract calcium electrochemically, and this was not possible. And this, uh, at that point, we started collaboration with Elena Arroyo at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, who did some DFT calculations, and we realized that those inputs from modeling were crucial to us to help in guiding our experimental research. So she uh, found out that really uh, calcium, uh, the migration barrier for calcium in this crystal structure is very high. So then we became interested in the work done and at, at the, by Jay Caesar and the, the studies on the spinel that Brian mentioned before. Uh, so the, the group of Christian Person in 2015, they investigated a lot of spinel compounds, not only magnesium, but also calcium. And they came uh, with the suggestion that uh, a, a, spi a calcium MN204 spinel polymorph would have a very low migration barrier for, um, for calcium due to the fact that it will be in a tetrahedral position and not that stable. The issue is that uh, this uh, spinel cannot be prepared, not even at high pressure. And finally, the most uh, stable polymorph is the marocite one, is the, this crystal structure here with double rutile change, which we, which we prepared very easily. And this crystal structure does also have these tunnels in, into which we thought calcium could be freely moving. But again, when we uh, experimentally uh, try to deintercalate calcium, this is not possible. And again, when we calculate the migration barriers for this polymorph, they are huge. So then we came back to the origin and uh, investigated TIS2, which has proven to intercalate many types of different species. And in fact, in 1974, Already, the group of Jean Ruxel in Nantes uh, was able to intercalate calcium into TIS2. At that point, this was not done electrochemically, but chemically, using uh, calcium dissolved in liquid ammonia. And they uh, found out that ammonia is co-intercalating uh, co with calcium in the interlayer space. And then, um, after the reaction uh, has um, taken place, then uh, they gently heat the, the compound, and then uh, they can evaporate aluminum and get to calcium 0.5 TIS2. And they even suggested the crystal structure for, for this compound. So we, uh, th another advantage is that TIS2 is commercial, so we prepared the, uh, a battery with, uh, with uh, TIS2. In this case, steel against calcium at 100 degrees C. This is the, the, the electrochemical curve we get, again, as shown for some magnesium compounds, hugely polarized. And we did diffraction at different stages of reduction and oxidation. And you see that, well, there is some peaks appearing at, at low voltage. This was a, 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 a slow rate. But despite this, we have remaining TIS2. So kinetics are far from being optimum. But uh, there are new phases appearing here at, at low voltage, at different, uh, uh, with peaks at low angles, at different uh, stages of, of the redox process. And then when we inverse the sign of the current, we recover uh, the pristine TIS2. So this was the first idea that maybe a cal electrochemical calcium intercalation could be reversible in this compound. Uh, trying to elucidate the crystal structure of these uh, phases is tricky, but we got some models. We were basing, basically inferring the uh, interlayer distance from the position of this first reflection here. And uh, there is a phase which we denote phase one, which is very expanded, which we believe is due to the co-intercalation of solvent molecules with calcium in the interlayer space. Then we have another phase which has the same parameters as the one found by Jean Ruxel, which we believe could be the very same phase with maybe naked calcium uh, intercalated in the interlayer distance. And finally, another phase that might be a, a stage two phase. 
But of course, we have a mixture of phases, so refining the calcium occupancy is not viable, especially if we have to consider also uh, the presence of molecule, electrolyte molecules in the crystal structure. So we did uh, an additional, we use an additional characterization technique. In this case, we, we are lucky to count with the ALBA synchrotron very close to our facilities. And we, uh, we did some transmission X-ray microscopy with a radiation on the calcium LH. And then we used the standards to see the density of calcium in, the, in those uh, different compounds. And this, um, this um, orange shell, is, uh, we believe, is calcium carboxylates due to the, uh, for, uh, the composition of the electrolyte molecules. Then this in red is calcium fluoride coming from the decomposition of the salt. We can also see it on the diffraction pattern. But finally, these pink bubbles are calcium intercalated into the crystal structure of, of the IS2. So um, this is, we believe, the, the final proof that really calcium is intercalating in the structure. But of course, the, the polarization is huge and there are several issues. So at this point, we thought, OK, what about maybe if we separate problems? Uh, so calcium uh, anodes is, uh, has uh, issues per se. So let's try to investigate only cathodes and detect their own issues and try to decrease the temperature, which is always a problem. So then uh, we, we had to use other counter-electrodes, and then we, we, uh, we came to use activated carbon as counter-electrode, as Glenn Amatucci did in the past. Also, the group of Doron Auerbach was exploring uh, positive electrode materials using activated carbon. And there are some companies, uh, one German company, for instance, producing um, these as, as a cloth. So it's very easy, it's commercial. So we decided to change our protocol to use carbon cloth as negative electrode. This is the only issue here is that it has a capacitive mechanism, so the, the capacity is very small. So then you need to make sure that your cell is well balanced, that you have an excess capacity to test your positive electrode, but this proved to, to work very well. And in the case of TIS2, we were able to use a calcium TFSI, which is also commercial and is sold very dry by some, by some companies and used, for instance, PC. And this enabled us to, to, again, repeat the test at 100 degrees C. And we see that here there are only two phases forming. So the phase two is not, is not being formed. And uh, so the, the electrolyte does have an influence on the redox mechanism, but we were able also to decrease the temperature and still see the intercalation in TIS2. So then uh, we were able to do some operando uh, diffraction at the, uh, at the uh, ALBA synchrotron. We were using these uh, cells, which enable circulation of a fluid, so you can do experiments in temperature. And in this case, we did uh, some experiments at 65 degrees C. And uh, we see that the mechanism is even more complex than what we have thought, because uh, some of the, of the peaks of those phases are shifting depending on the rate of reduction. So maybe the degree of solvent cointercalation can be different as well. So this is something that we are still elucidating. So then, uh, just to come back to our efforts to look for, um, for uh, calcium uh, uh, transition metal compounds, we were interested in, uh, as I mentioned, uh, perovskite, but also in hexagonal perovskite. And this is a, a derivative of a, an hexagonal perovskite, which uh, do this family of compounds has been studied a lot for its magnetic properties. It has a, a structure which has this 1D framework, which is uh, uh, chains of uh, octahedra and trigonal prismatic uh, cobalt or cobalt and another transition metal, like for instance manganese, which are sharing phases. So they were looking at the couplings between the transition metal in the, ch in the chains and between different chains. So they, there is really a lot of literature on these compounds. And in between those chains, there are calcium, which in our eyes could be uh, maybe mobile. So uh, we explored this family of compounds. And at this time, we, were already, uh, uh, um, we had already established this um, this uh, protocol to, to measure uh, uh, against activated uh, carbon, and we were able to do operando studies uh, at, the, at the ALBA synchrotron uh, at, at room temperature. And uh, so we, we followed the oxidation and the reduction, and we over-reduced the sample ex situ as well, and this is essentially what we get. So uh, when we start oxidizing, so trying to extract calcium from the crystal structure, 
we see that the peaks of the main phase decrease and there is a new phase appearing, but when we reduce, we see no changes in the diffraction pattern. So the capacity that we recover may be related to site reactions because the, really there is, uh, there is no changes in, at this point. So we were able to elucidate the crystal structure of the phase which was formed upon oxidation, both with cobalt and manganese, and it turns to be um, um, a, a, a very uh, complex uh, crystal structure um, an incommensurate, with an incommensurate uh, modulation. But nonetheless, we were able to refine the, the calcium content, and we were able to confirm that uh, there is really extraction of calcium from this crystal structure. But at this point, none of our efforts uh, have been successful in re intercalating calcium in the structure. So this may be due to different issues, maybe desolvation of calcium from the electrolyte molecules to reintercalate is an issue, uh, or maybe this new crystal structure has in intrinsic issues for calcium migration, and this we cannot confirm by DFT because, as I was mentioning, it is an incommensurate modulate uh, structure. So uh, finally, we decided to embark on a more systematic study guided by, by modeling, again with, with Elena Arroyo in Madrid, and she did a screening of many, many uh, calcium transition metal compounds from the ISCD uh, database, trying to look at the, at the migration barriers, trying to, do, to look at the volume changes upon calcium deintercalation, and she came up with a few interesting suggestions. So the first uh, one that she suggested was this oxide, calcium 4 iron 9017 which he has a very um, uh, unique I would say uh, crystal structure uh, this is made of these uh, uh, trigonal vi pyramids uh, sharing uh, vertex these those layers other layers of uh, iron oxygen octahedra sharing edges and those are connected by iron oxygen tetrahedra and in the middle, there are calcium ions sitting. So this is a really uh, strange uh, structure, a strange composition as well. The oxidation state for iron here is 2.8. So we wouldn't get any uh, interesting capacity unless we can play in the, uh, in the iron-3, iron-4 redox couple. But still, we thought it was uh, really uh, relevant to investigate it uh, chemically. And one of the first issues we had is that this crystal structure is reported from single crystal X-ray diffraction. So we had to see how to prepare this in the bulk. This turned to be uh, very tricky. And finally, we only succeeded uh, from those specific precursors and uh, tuning very well the, the oxidation state of, uh, of iron by playing with the precursors in a sealed tube and with quenching. So this took us a while, and finally we got a diffraction pattern which seems to be what we expected, but there are some differences here. We did some electron diffraction and we found some streaking along the C-axis, which was indicative of some sort of disorder. And we were, when we were trying to refine this crystal structure from synchrotron or neutron data, we, we ran into a lot of problems we, because we were not uh, able to, to, to get a successful refinement. So then we started collaboration with CIC Energy Gune, with Monse Casas and Jon Serrano, and the FOLDS program that they are developing, because we thought that maybe this could be due to the presence of stacking folds. And uh, as you have seen, those tetrahedra here are linking the layers, but maybe there, there could be a folding in, in, the, in this uh, structure. And here you can see the simulation for the fully ordered structure. And uh, this is the experimental pattern that we get. And this is the disordered uh, um, simulated structure with a lot of stacking folds. So we got a very good matching, and we thought that this made sense because, of course, this, is, uh, uh, this phase is metastable. It's prepared at high temperature, then we quench, so it should be folded. But are those folds real? But then we did some TEM, and we were able to really see that uh, the structure is full of stacking folds. So now at this point, of course, as you may have imagined, this phase is not electrochemically active. We didn't manage to get any calcium extraction from it. But the question is, is it due to the fact that there are so many stacking folds here that the calcium cannot migrate in the crystal structure? 
And then this is still an open question because for the moment we have not been able to prepare uh, this phase with less stacking faults because it's very tricky. So uh, then other uh, uh, phases that Elena suggested are uh, the two that I will, I will uh, mention now. So one is uh, calcium 2 MnO 3.5. This is a defective radoslin popper uh, uh, perovskite-like structure. And, uh, and you see that uh, it has a, a defect uh, oxygen, which is here. So, in fact, uh, uh, manganese sorry, does not have an octahedral coordination, but a pyramidal one. And this is the, the view of the structure. She calculated uh, the barriers for migration of calcium in the crystal structure. Of course, in this direction, it's huge. But uh, in some of the directions, it turned to be uh, rather uh, affordable, so to say, or around 1.0 uh, electron volts, which is high, but maybe achievable. And the theoretical capacity, if we only played on the redox 3, uh, manganese 3, manganese 4, would be interesting. So we decided to prepare it. And the other phase which she came with is the calcium V204, which is, has a crystal structure very similar to the manganese polymorphs that we had studied before without any success. And again, in some directions, she really found very low migration barriers, about 0.5. And while we were doing this study, a paper by Piero Canepa in Singapore appeared, also calculating the same uh, low uh, barriers for the migration of calcium. So, okay, we prepared these uh, two phases. We, uh, and we, we try to oxidize them electrochemically. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, the, the voltages that we uh, obtain are really very high. So we have for sure a lot of electrolyte decomposition. And likely these capacities uh, do mean nothing because there is a lot of electrolyte decomposition. But still, there seems to be some activity. And when we did uh, X-ray diffraction on the oxidized uh, compounds, we see that there is indeed a change in the diffraction pattern. So something is going on in those two materials when we oxidize them in, in calcium cells. So to try to elucidate which was the crystal structure of these oxidized uh, samples, we did again some uh, um, X-ray diffraction at, at ALVA. And uh, in this uh, case, uh, we, we uh, will first show the results on the calcium 2 MnO 3.5. And in this case, again, as uh, seen before, we start oxidizing, we see changes in the diffraction pattern, but when we reverse the sign of the current, nothing changes. So everything, the evolution that we see is, is irreversible. And we thought it would be a case similar to the cobalt one. The issue is that when we go here and refine the calcium occupation in the crystal structure, it hasn't changed. So we are not really extracting calcium from a crystal structure, which is puzzling, because we seem to be oxidizing and something is going on. So the most obvious choice, if there is, is not positive electrode, uh, um, positive ions going out, there might be negative ions coming in. I mean, it's the, it's the, only, uh, the only possibility. And which negative ions? Well, maybe oxide or maybe fluoride, because uh, uh, brothers and popper compounds are, have been studied for as cathodes for fluoride uh, ion batteries. So then we did a, a Fourier map of, uh, of these um, of this oxidized phase, and we indeed see some uh, uh, electron density in some places. First of all, in the, in the vacancies, so the oxygen vacancies that they are in the structure, which I showed before, are filled. And not only there, but also in this uh, calcium oxygen layer, which is where fluorine intercalates when they are looking at this for, for fluoride ion batteries. So we presume this was due to fluorine intercalation. We confirm this by yields and EDX, and we see that the, the amount of fluoride is slightly higher than the amount of vacancies. So we are uh, filling uh, the, not only the vacancies, but also some positions here. To, so this uh, material is useless as, uh, as cathode for, for calcium batteries. L maybe it could be interesting in, in, in the fluoride uh, batteries. So. Um, and this, the final uh, proof is that 
we only form this oxidized phase in fluorine containing electrolytes. So we, uh, we uh, use uh, LP30, LIPF6, uh, which has fluoride, and, uh, and you, it forms you to electrolyte the composition at high voltage. We form the phase. With cesium fluoride as electrolyte, we form this phase, and with LIBOP, which doesn't have any fluoride, we do not form this phase. So for us, this is the final confirmation that the charge compensation mechanism, in this case, does not involve any calcium extraction, but just fluorine intercalation. And finally, we come to the results of calcium V2O4. And in this case, again, we oxidize and we see some changes in the diffraction pattern. And then, uh, but in this case, when we reverse the sign of the current, we see an evolution of the partners. But strangely, it's not, it, it does not follow the same path. So the oxidation seems to be biphasic, while the reduction seems to go through a solid solution mechanism. So when we refine the crystal structure of the oxidized phase, we find indeed that the, the, um, the amount of calcium in the crystal structure has decreased by not much, 0.6, which is not a lot, but still coming from where we come, this was really a, a success to us. And when we reduce, uh, this phase uh, uh, is still there, but, but uh, the, the, um, the cell parameters do change when we intercalate uh, calcium. So here you see, for instance, the, uh, along the time, the phase fraction, so the pristine phase decreases when we oxidize. We have this new oxidized uh, phase appearing, and then upon reduction, the amount of both phases is not, uh, uh, not uh, modified. And the calcium uh, occupancy in this, in this phase is, is um, the calcium content in, in, is constant upon oxidation, but is increasing upon reduction. And the total amount of calcium in, in both uh, phases is also increasing upon reduction. So we see some reversibility here. The, the reasons for this uh, change in the, in the mechanism are not still uh, well understood. And of course, uh, more work is needed on, on this compound. But at least this is a proof that we were able to de-intercalate and re-intercalate naked calcium ions in this crystal structure. Upon cycling, the, um, the electrochemical curve is very different. So uh, this is also in agreement with the fact that this first cycle is different from the others, but we still need to understand why. So uh, there is uh, still a long way to go, but at least this is a final proof that this is uh, reversible. So finally, uh, to, uh, to recap, and uh, also leave uh, time for discussion and, and questions. This is a summary of, of the landscape that we found when looking at very different uh, uh, materials, screening them as potential uh, positive electrodes for calcium cells. In TIS2, which almost intercalates anything, we found that uh, the, we can intercalate mostly solvated calcium ions, but it's reversible. For, uh, for some other compounds, like uh, those uh, derivatives of the hexagonal perovskite, we can extract calcium, but it doesn't seem to be reversible. But it, it, of course, remains to be seen whether this behavior is common to other electrolytes or not, because we were not exploring different electrolyte formulations. Some other compounds, we, we can only prepare them in uh, containing a large amount of stacking folds, and these may also have an influence in the, in the behavior we observe. In some cases, we're able to oxidize the, the compounds, but the charge, com the charge compensation mechanism uh, induces, I mean, is related to intercalation of anions and not extraction of cations. And finally, for some of the compounds at this moment, only calcium V204, it seems to be possible that, uh, that in extraction and intercalation of calcium takes place. So there are a lot of uh, materials to explore. And here, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this compound is almost isostructural with the manganese one, but really the cell parameters are different. The, the, the size of the, of the positions into which calcium has to migrate is different, and this makes a huge difference in the migration barrier. So this is something that needs to be explored as well. 
And so uh, we believe that uh, we cannot neglect the fact that when, when looking at, uh, when screening positive electrode materials, one has to take into account the electrolyte, even if we don't want to, uh, because the, the, uh, with multivalent ions, the interaction with solvents is crucial. And then, of course, we need to couple a lot with research on the electrolytes, because this will have a, a huge influence, we believe, in, in the results we get. In, in TIS2, only switching from calcium BF4 to TIS2, FSI made a difference. And um, finally, also, as uh, also already pointed out by, by Brian, the, the methodology in, in, in new uh, battery chemistries needs to be uh, uh, carefully developed. Uh, blank experiments are crucial, three electrode cells using a, 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 a uh, an array of techniques as large as possible to make sure that all the pieces of the puzzle fit, because we do not know the other battery components well. There are many possible side reactions, and we don't want our results to be biased. And I, I would like to uh, finish by this uh, slide, which I like a lot. This was uh, given by Ralph Broad, which was one of the pioneers of the lithium-ion battery technology. And he tries to sketch the whole process for a new battery technology uh, development. From a concept validation, someone that one day has an idea in the lab and does some experiments with, with, with some grams of materials, with one PhD, things work well, then we need to scale up, we, do, we need to do testing and so on. And finally, only some of the technologies, very few, will go to the market and after a very long time. And in this, uh, and in this case, you will see that some of the results within the eMagic project with magnesium have, have followed this pathway. So a lot of materials investigated, it's tricky to make prototypes and so on. So I think this is a, a nice chart to exemplify our research. So uh, even in the most uh, conservative uh, estimation, this means uh, many years. But I want to finish with a positive message. I am an optimistic person by nature, and um, even if we didn't have very... Um, uh, astonishing results in terms of capacity or cyclability or anything. I think that uh, we have learned a lot from the system and these new battery chemistries, as, as mentioned by Brian, are a nice playground for us as material chemists. And just uh, finally, would like to acknowledge all the people that participated in this work, which is a lot, a lot of people from, from ICMAP who have uh, uh, done diff worked on the electrolyte, on the, on the cathodes, different cathodes. Our collaborators, uh, Patrick Johansson in Sweden for electrolytes, of course, Elena Arroyo with all the DFT calculations, people from CIC who are helping us with these uh, structures with stacking folds. Patrice uh, Rosier in Sirimat in France with the synthesis of the, of the vanadium uh, compounds and also people at ALBA for characterization and Toyota who funded our beginning in the, in the calcium world and then we were funded by the European Commission for a project which has recently uh, finished. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.